Hello there, sword friends. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. It is a 9260 katana sent to me from Dragon Sword for the purposes of review and destruction, which is what you're going to see in this video. Before I get into it, though, some notes. One, this is a free review sample. If you think that makes me biased, you know at the start. Two, I do study Japanese-style swordsmanship, and I've been reviewing swords for a number of years now, but I don't fancy myself an expert or authority figure on the subject. And lastly, do keep in mind that this sword is $125 new. This one features an extra $30 add-on for special special better Ito, which a little tighter, a little better, something like that. Uh, so that brings it to a retail price of roughly $150, though I believe the, the base price, the $125, is actually $75 now. I don't know how long that's going to go, though. So I'm thinking about it in the purposes of this review as a $150 sword, even though you might be able to get it a little cheaper. Uh, with all that context in mind, though, I'm going to jump into the review. First, I'm going to start with the Kashra, the end cap, the pommel right here. Now, from a stylistic perspective, I've seen this set of Fuchikashra before. They're relatively simple and I think uh, pretty prolific in terms of the mass production inexpensive swords out there. And frankly, I like them. I, I don't like it when inexpensive swords bite off more than they can chew in terms of trying to make something fancy. This is a relatively simple set of fittings, but they have some depth and dimension, some, some curves, and I don't make out a lot of casting lines either, despite the fact that these are painted and would clearly show them. I can see some indication of where they were cast, but not a lot. And overall, the, the paint that's on there, while I'd prefer a genuine patina, I would settle for this paint, given that it held up as well as it did. I've dropped this sword, I've thrown it at a tree, and I've used it for a couple months, and overall the paint is still on there and, and pretty good. But I would expect at some point that it would come off and you would see some of the bare metal underneath. I, I believe they're made from some sort of alloy, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that. Uh, what I can tell you, though, is it also has some better shitadome in it. Shitadome are these little washers that go under, well, between the space where the Ito runs through the Kashra, and normally they're a spiky thing that you see on every sword. These are a little more subtle, a little higher end, a little better, and that's nice to see given that you can't easily change them out. The Kasha is comfortable, doesn't have any hot spots, and overall I think does what it's supposed to do. Where it lines up with the, the Ito on the, the rest of the handle is also pretty good. Now this did have a little bit of extra money dedicated towards better Ito. I don't know if it's the Hishigami or a, a more professional person doing it, but the transitions overall were pretty good. I don't know if it was glued down initially. Right now I can wiggle the Kasha a little bit, but it's still really, really quite tight. It doesn't budge, it didn't pull off. And again, like I said, I've swung at it, I pushed it all the way to failure, and the, the Kasha is still on there. A lot of times these come off as I'm cutting, as I'm doing a lot of <laughs> a lot of use, as I even sometimes as I practice Iaito, Iaito and just swish the sword around at the air, sometimes these Kashras come off. This one is still on here tight after I've pushed the sword all the way to failure, after it's been thrown and hit into a tree, it's still it's still on there and still quite tight. Uh, the lines and everything like that are also quite good. There's maybe a slight ledge on here, but it's really quite small, and I have to be pretty nitpicky about it. As I move on to this guy, the handle right here, well, I can tell you, frankly, I like the shape. I like how it feels in my hand overall. It's a little bit on the narrower side, and despite the fact I have large sausage fingers, I actually tend to prefer a smaller grip, a smaller or narrower grip. Um, this one feels the part. It feels really quite good in the hand. The Ito is also very tight. Ito often can be loosey-goosey, and this one is not perfect. Perfect would be that if I lean into it with all my weight, the diamonds don't move around at all. Here I can displace them, though very, very little, and it gets an exceptional score for the mass production swords <laughs> around, around about the 150 price point. There are $1,000 swords that don't have Ito as nice as this. There are $3,000 swords that don't have Ito as nice as this. So uh, the diamonds do wander around a little bit. Not exceptionally, though, and given the very low bar uh, for swords in this price point, this is really a highlight of, of what is available on this sword. Um, anyway, the color, I don't necessarily mind it. The silk does have a kind of a, a cheaper synthetic feel, but how it's applied, how it's tied on is is overall quite good. Again, slightly wandering diamonds. It's it's really quite small. Um, the Samegawa panels underneath here don't really show a ledge. I'm not sure if they're laid in there or not, but uh, what I can tell you is that I don't make out a, a particularly large ledge or anything like that, though the nodule sizes are small. It's not a particularly high-end Samegawa. Uh, that said, I'm not expecting it to be because this is an inexpensive piece. The Minuki are kind of muddy looking here, and I don't necessarily think they're the greatest choice. It'd honestly be fine if just like a bar was put in or something else, that rather than what maybe is a, a muddy dragon or something. I'm not, <laughs> not entirely sure what they are. Uh, they also stand out a little bit. They're, they're dark and black, and they pull my eye in in contrast to the brown and white. Uh, so I'm not a big fan of, of the Minuki. 
Uh, moving on to the Fuchi up here, and this is basically a match for the Kashra. It's held up well. The transitions overall are quite good. It didn't move around. It seems to be uh, overall pretty well executed. Uh, last bit to note about the Nakago is that it has a single Makugi peg, and there's some attention paid to the Makugi peg here. It's been rounded. It's a little nuance of something that I like, but a lot of times I see a chopstick shoved in the hole. This has got a little bit more attention to it. It's a little easier to push on. I will, I will take the sword apart, and you'll see the Nakago in just a moment, but the basic gist is that it is nice. The, the Makugi has some extra attention paid to it, and that's what flows throughout the sword. There's a lot of little things that have somebody has paid attention to, and uh, and just the Makugi peg is one of those. Um, moving up to the Suba. Now, the Suba, as you can see, is in a state of disrepair. It's bent over because I threw this sword at a tree a number of times. But before, it was straight, and it is iron and has a natural patina on it, and it is really quite nice for, for the money. It's light, and if you're training with the sword and you want something lighter rather than heavy, well, it, it was that. It didn't have any hot spots or anything that bit into my hand, though theoretically I could put a fingernail in there and, and kind of get my finger in there. If I avoided that, though, there weren't any sharp ledges or anything like that. It was really, well, really excellent Suba for, again, a sword in this price point. Um, on top of that, it did its job. A lot of these inexpensive subas, if I throw them at a tree and they hit the suba, will bend or break and break off in such a way where they're cracked and don't give me the impression that they would absorb a sword strike particularly well. And this one, while it's bent in such a way that uh, <laughs> that maybe that sword would have met your hand eventually, uh, they, they didn't break and they didn't shatter. It, it did what it was supposed to do from a relatively thin um, and kind of delicate looking guard. Moving up to the habaki area. Well, first off, the transition to where the habaki is uh, lines up pretty good. There's some slight transitional spaces here that don't line up perfectly, but nothing that's too gratuitous to my eye. It, it overall looks the part and is, is quite nice. Uh, tension on it is also quite nice. Now, the sword is, is broken, so I can't show you, but it didn't rattle, and the tension on it is actually still quite good. And in tense, <laughs> tension in such a way that if I push it with my thumb, it comes out easily, but it's also, you know, uh, retained well enough in there that if I bend over it doesn't fall out and I didn't have to do any shimming or anything like that out of the box. Um, this isn't necessarily something that's the end of the world. If a sword is too loose or too tight, it's kind of expected that you have to do some some sort of something with them to get them exactly where you want it. But very often that's the case. And in this case, just being able to take it out of the box and have it having it fit well was appreciated. And given that it's coming from a completely different climate, um, I don't know if it's just luck of the draw or if it's uh, if it's intentional on their part. But in any case, it fit well. I didn't have to do anything with it. I was able to practice with it for a few months and not have any, any filing, any shimming, anything like that. The tension on it stayed pretty good. The Saya, if I move down here, is also got a nice subtle little detail in that it thins out slightly and then expands to become a little bit thinner. Now, it does feel... Thin. And this was a critique that I made in the previous Dragon Sword review that I had that does feel like the wood is getting pretty thin, so I don't expect the Saya to be super durable. Um, though, historically, you, you, you could easily have another one made. That's not the case now. These are pretty expensive to have replaced. It's nice to see this kind of elegant taper. Um, at the same time, a lot of sword Saya's are thicker because it costs a lot of money to have them... Um, chiseled out individually so that they can have some sort of additional thickness out here at the tip. Uh, that doesn't, this appears to be kind of on the thinner side. At the same time, it, it feels nice. I, 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 w I guess I would prefer this uh, if I had to have it made, even knowing that it's thin and maybe not the most durable. I'm not going out to battle with them. They sit in a sword bag. You know, sometimes they get lightly tapped into the ground if I'm doing a seated kata or something like that, so they don't necessarily get beat on, and I'm not going to take it out of my obi and thwack somebody with it. But if I did, um, the the head would probably win before this, this scabbard would. Um, other notes, it doesn't have a kind of horn koiguchi on it. It's a relatively inexpensive scabbard. It's painted in such a way that it looks kind of cool, but it, it's uh, relatively simple fittings. And again, all of that is perfectly within reason for a sword in this price point. Where I start to take issue is when you go above the four or $500 range and you still have, you know, not authentic horn pieces on here, uh, then then I, well, that's a feature that I like to see in more expensive swords, but at 125 bucks, I'm, I'm glad it's not made out of cardboard. Moving on to the blade, the pointy pointy stabby part. So 
this piece right here is now broken, uh, but it took an immense amount of punishment, which I will talk about. The, the blade itself, though, didn't have a whole lot of features. While it was together, it did have a bohe that ran down. The terminations on it were not fantastic. The blade is through hardened as well, so there's not really much in the surface of the steel to look at. Sometimes with a very elaborate polish, you can have a through hardened blade that still has some metallurgical effects that are brought out by, by the polisher. In this case, though, there's more of a satin polish done to it, so there's not really much to see. Now this satin polish from a user perspective is not bad because then you can take uh, a Scotch-Brite fine pad and or 600 grit sandpaper or something and scuff along the surface and not really have to worry about scratches and things like that. And it may be addressable uh, by somebody more handy than me. At the same time, it loses some of the, the thrill that you typically see in a Japanese sword. And frankly, there are swords in the $150 price point that do have better polishes that are differentially hard that do show you those characters uh, or at least those characteristics of a sword. In this case it's a through hardened blade that's focusing a bit more on durability um, so I, I don't often see them in through hardened blades at this price point. Anyway it's just if if that's your if that's what you're after if you're looking for a sword with a hamon and something that has some of those more traditional Japanese sword characteristics they're available in swords of this price point uh, but not available in this particular one. Anyway, uh, there's a Bohi, there's a Kasaki, there was some attempt at a Yukote on the Kasaki. It was just sanded a different way, but there were some details that were there. Uh, more or less, though, it's pretty plain looking, and it has the same kind of silhouette that you may be seeing a lot in Japanese-style swords out of Longchuan, China, um, but overall it was well executed. Dimensions, incidentally, are in the description down below if you are interested. Um, so that brings me to usage. Now, from a practitioner standpoint, doing EI with it, this was a very light and fun sword to use. There are some things that I like about swords. Bohi, I could move it around, I could hear it, it was audible. It wasn't terribly easy to hear because the Kasaki wasn't reinforced, but I could hear it and it was light enough to, to move around easily. Uh, while I was going through some struggles with my elbow, this was a sword that I, I leaned on a little bit because it was on the lighter side. And the Ito as well uh, gives me a solid feeling. I talked about how it's tight. If Ito is really loose, it's tough to feel super connected to the weapon like you're in complete control. The Ito on these dragon swords tends to be on the tighter side and it gives me a very strong connection to the sword and it makes training with it a, a better experience in my mind. So I did enjoy using it. It was light, lively, easy to move around. The scabbard bumped on the habaki just a little bit. Um, I think that's that's part of not having a particularly refined scabbard. It, it does a lot of things right for a sword in this price point, but obviously there's always room for improvement. The slight ledge in the front of the uh, habaki area here, but I really found that it kind of caught a little bit more on the sides than anything else. Uh, that said, once you kind of get used to how it goes in, because you can twist it the wrong way and uh, stick it in the kind of long way, where, wrong way where it binds a little bit, uh, once you got used to it, you could, but you have to work around it a little bit as a tool. Still, I would say overall it was a fun experience to use and not necessarily a bad one. I would say, though, that the Ronin Dojo Pro drew and sheathed a little bit better. Uh, the Ito on this, or not the Dojo Pro, the Ronin RK series, which is similar to the price point of this one, uh, drew and sheathed a little bit better than this one does. Uh, the Ito on this, though, is, is a lot finer feeling, a lot better feeling in the hand. Um, and the, the Suba and fittings I, I happen to like a little bit more, particularly the Suba being iron and having a little bit more delicate look instead of cast or water jet cut out. Anyway, um, that was EI. It was fun to train with. It gets a thumbs up from me in that category, given the price point. There's room for improvement, but at $150-ish, you can't necessarily expect the world. From a cutting standpoint, it was sharp out of the box. It cut water bottles and pool noodles and did all of the kind of quick, light, lively backyard stuff really well. It cut tatami reasonably well. It cut just about anything I threw at it <laughs> reasonably well. Um, I did a lot of dumb stuff with the sword, and honestly, it, it held up remarkably well for a light sword that's through hardened. A lot of times, um, if I'm cutting some of the dumb stuff and I bought my stand or things like that, these inexpensive swords, I'm not necessarily expecting the world out of in terms of heat treatment. So deflections, dulling, that kind of stuff would be par for the course. I didn't spot any of that with the average stuff. When I moved on to the more abusive stuff, I still really didn't see it. I chopped into logs and boards and all sorts of other dumb things and I didn't notice that the edge was diminishing, I didn't notice any edge rolling, I didn't notice really any issues with the sword itself. Uh, I later went and started throwing it at a tree and this is where swords tend to develop some issues. The handles sometimes crack and pop off, katra have been known to be dented or come off, subas often will, will shatter or have other issues and obviously the sword did take some damage here but 
not really a lot. The tip went in the ground and developed some sort of, well, some sort of edge damage because I believe it, <laughs> the tip was thrust into the frozen ground and there are rocks down there, so not, not a terrible surprise. The suba bent, but overall the sword was still in usable shape. No bending, no twisting, no edge damage with the exception of the kasaki, and obviously the sword still maintained itself as a weapon through being tossed at a tree. Now, it's not a scientific thing being tossed at a tree, especially when you don't when you throw it as bad as I do and don't hit the tree every time. But what it does tell you is if you were a samurai on horseback and you lost your bow or your spear or whatever you were actually using, you were going at it with uh, with your sword and you dropped it or lost it, uh, then you know conceivably similar amounts of torture could be had in, in that kind of experience. So if you lost your sword, dropped it, if it got flung or smacked out of your hand, uh, similar kinds of shock could could happen as it impacts from from that kind of activity. Uh, so ideally it holds up to that, and for the most part I would say it did. The Suba theoretically could be straightened out, but also you could take this sword apart and replace it with something else if you were concerned about the, the metal being fatigued, which which frankly I might be. Um, I was impressed though that it held up and walked away with as little damage, particularly on the handle. I was expecting more, more to happen, and honestly I was expecting the Suba to fold over even more or break off entirely, uh, and neither was the case. So then I brought it to the Tree of Woe. Now bear in mind that I am testing this on a day that was a little bit above 20, but between 20 and 30 degrees, more towards the 20 degree side, I believe. And so it's pretty cold outside as I'm testing this. And the Tree of Woe has gotten its name because slapping swords on the side of the blade uh, has broken a few times. There's been a sword from United Cutlery, a sword from Cloudhammer, uh, people that seem to, to do reasonably well with heat treatments and slapping a sword on the side of the tree has yielded results where the swords have basically shattered, like like the tree's got some hidden metal in it or something. I've, I've looked, it doesn't, but anyway. Uh, basic gist is I was able to slap this on uh, the Tree of Woe several times, really leaning into it the same way I've broken a few other swords and this one bent. It deformed a little bit, but it developed a slight set. After after 10 licks, I gave up, um, but it did really lean into it. I hit it pretty hard, especially towards the end, and the sword did take a bend, but it did not break. Uh, moving on from there, I brought it over to the Croquet Stick of Doom, which is a mild steel rod. Uh, striking the Croquet Stick of Doom, basically it jutted in into a, a pretty fine edge. It cut in about a millimeter, millimeter and a half in terms of damage and how far in it impacts. After it rolled the edge or deflected or chipped off the edge, most of it is is breaking off, um, though there are some areas that look like deflections. It only goes in about a millimeter or so, and conceivably I would be able to sharpen these out. I, I could reform the profile of the edge a little bit and, and be able to even fix the damage that was here. It maintained itself as a weapon for quite some time. Now, further strikes though, eventually it did break, and what's notable is I didn't have to reverse the sword and strike it on the spine. Um, it'd be nice if, in, I guess in an ideal world, like the, the top-notch ratings for, for swords on their croquet steak of doom would be if I have to give up on baking, hitting their croquet steak, go whack another sword on sword on edge on edge contact to diminish or use some sort of other tool, then go back to the croquet steak and break it. I didn't have to do that. It's several hard strikes in the croquet steak of doom, and then eventually this sword broke. But uh, making it to the croquet steak is an accomplishment, particularly for a light blade, and also in winter, blades tend to break a little bit easier when it's bitter cold outside, particularly when it's below freezing. I don't know the metallurgical context around that, but um, they do tend to break a little bit easier. And what I found when this sword broke is that the grain structure here looks overall quite good. It's reasonably tight. I can't make out individual grains with my naked eye, um, and generally speaking, what that means is a sword holds up a little better, which I would say this one did, particularly to uh, things that have broken other swords that are as robust or more so than this one. Anyway, so that's pushing it all the way to failure, bringing it to the croquet stake of doom. <laughs> you get to see how many licks it took to get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. The sword is now broken, and, and what can I tell you at the end of it? Would I, would I say it's worth it or not? And the short answer is, yeah. Um, this sword held up what I would say is remarkably well. Uh, it was heat treated well. It did all the things that a sword should do and more for the $150 price point. The Ito being tight is a really big one for me. Um, and if this sword is on sale and you can get it with the tight Ito for a little bit less money, then even more so. Uh, but what it lacked in refinement, it really made up for in cost and some of the other features that, uh, well, that you get with a sword in terms of it holding up well, having a nice sharp edge straight out of the box. And there's, you just can't have the, the world for 150 bucks. But I think you did get a lot in the package here, and it seems like a great value. So anyway, for me, yes, I would say this sword is worth the asking price of 150 bucks. Uh, again, you might be able to get it for less. 
Uh, anyway, that's what I got. Hopefully this video has been interesting. Hopefully it's been helpful. And as always, cheers and thanks for watching.